Welcome to the Raising Capital panel. We will begin shortly. Jorge is an accomplished 20-year mission-focused business leader having served as a U.S. Air Force contracting officer. Jorge led foundational AFWorks business strategies and realized the USAF revitalization of the U.S. Air Force Small Business Innovation Research Program and other strategic innovation initiatives. Jorge now optimizes capital factory programs to help all portfolio companies, commercial partners, and entrepreneurs organize, collaborate, and deliver innovative solutions to all state, federal, and defense partners. Please welcome Jorge. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? My name is Jorge Manresa, and I uh, just saw that really great introduction, that video. Pretty cool, pretty snazzy music. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's uh, Innovation Summit and particularly to our panel in, in uh, Raising Capital. So before I introduce, uh, well, here comes the panel. <laughs> I'm introducing uh, Casey Purley from Army Applications Lab. I also have Michael Piller from uh, Air Force Rapid X team. Also Chase Eisen, Air Force Rapid X team. And then we also have two gentlemen from the National Geospatial Agency. Uh, Lance Rogers and David Grover. And last but certainly not the least is my co-host, Helena Krusek from Capital Factory, uh, Chief Adventure Associate for the federal programs. So, you know, without further ado, I just want to, before we queue up and introduce the panel, I just want to say that uh, I'm so excited uh, to bring these federal partners to us to help educate you on how to best fundraise with the federal government. I know that, you know, being an entrepreneur takes a whole lot of passion takes a whole lot of grit, takes a whole lot of networking, right? And, and a whole lot of just effort that uh, when you create the network and that coalition of the willing for yourselves in order to be successful, uh, you can go to great lengths and doing some great things uh, for your communities, for your family, um, and even for society. So, but there's one aspect, one big aspect that we can't uh, not talk about, which is fundraising. Obviously it takes money uh, to make money, right? It takes money to product, you know, to bring something to production. It takes money to bring in the resources to bear to really bring something of importance to society. So that's what I have here today. I've got Helena, you know, he, she's an expert at the uh, dilutive, you know, or the venture and private equity side of the house. So I'm going to have her just kind of help, uh, you know, touch on some of those areas as we go through our conversation with our panelists. And obviously our non-dilutive experts are right here on this panel. So I'm super excited uh, to have you guys uh, just, uh, you know, talk about um, your different programs at Army Applications Lab, National Geospatial Agency, and RapidX, or the, uh, you know, Air Force Arm supporting, business arm supporting uh, AFWorks. Um, and let's just really talk about what your programs are. So for the audience, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to let uh, these individuals talk about their programs for a few minutes. We're gonna go around the room. And then what we're gonna do is just have a great conversation, ask them questions, put them on the post. Um, and Helena and I will definitely uh, help provide equal time to everybody to be able to answer the great questions that you're gonna have to us for us today. So without further ado, ladies first, Dr. Casey Purley, Army Applications Lab. How are you? I'm good, how are you guys? Thanks so much for having me today. Hey, I'm doing super great. Now, I'm hearing some really great stuff that's going on with Army Applications Lab down here in Austin, Texas. Obviously, you guys were stood up a couple of years ago for those who don't understand, you know, didn't, don't know that the Army showed up in Austin uh, with a great four-star command. And there's some great programs that uh, you've been talking to our community here locally, but for our friends up in Dallas um, and around the state that are watching today, could you give us a little bit of a taste of what programs you have that can help provide uh, non-dilutive funding to the efforts that they do each and every day. Absolutely. Um, so as Jorge said, you know, Army Applications Lab or AAL as we affectionately call ourselves is about two years old. And our mission is to identify, evaluate and transition technology to soldiers and to fundamentally change the way the Army does business in the, in, you know, in the process of doing so. We know working with the DOD is hard 
Uh, so we spent our first two years asking solvers like you, venture capitalists, aggregators, chambers of commerce, why is working with the DOD hard? Um, I think it was therapy for them. They gave us some really great feedback. And to that point, all of our programs are designed to improve access, transparency, and speed to capital for all of our, our solver partners. When we talk about access, that's reduced application requirements and access to soldiers and stakeholders who are the problem owner. And that really is the key for us. We solve army problems. Um, you know, for the way every service innovates differently, um, the way that we found is really effective in the army is to go out with a problem, have all of our stakeholders aligned from the modernizers to the acquirers who are the people that buy the technology upfront. So there is that path to long-term revenue. That is that transparency piece that we like to talk about. And then also we know we got to get you capital quickly. The army is not great at that. Um, a lot of times what I like to call proof of concept contracts that are about $200,000 or less can take nine months. That's not okay for anybody. Um, so some of our recent programs, we've been able to get companies on contract within 30 days of solicitation close and then speed capital to them you know, within the second week of that program um, so that you aren't paying out of pocket to work with the DOD. Awesome. Well, Casey, that that is is pretty phenomenal. I'm super excited about your program because again, um, a lot not a lot of people know about it, but it's it's going to be really game changing in my in my eyes. Just like AppWorks was, and I'm not going to steal their thunder. They're going to talk about you know some of their programs with RapidX. But before doing that, I want to go ahead and hand it over to Helena. Helena, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. I was just on another panel, so I'm just I'm I'm running around discussions here today at UT Dallas. I'm doing great. How are you, Jorge? Awesome. Doing <laughs> super, super great. Just wanted to make sure that you got a chance to catch your breath from the other panel that you're on. Um, but to tell us a little bit before we move on to NGA, tell us a little bit about you know what you do on the you know federal side with the private equity side and then and then we'll move it over to uh, NGA to introduce their program. Yeah, certainly. So um, for those that don't know, I, I work for Capital Factory, and we like to think of ourselves as the, the center of gravity for entrepreneurship in the state of Texas. And what we're really trying to do, our mission, why we're here and what we're trying to do is to help technology entrepreneurs to meet the most important people in their lives. That's their, their customers, their mentors, their staff, and their very first institutional investors. And we do that in a lot of different ways. But really, at the end of the day, there's there's two main ways that we engage with entrepreneurs. Um, one through our ventures program, um, formerly rebranded as it was formerly an accelerator, but we've rebranded to sort of get away from that because that's that's not really what we're doing. It's much more of an ongoing relationship with the companies where we're working with them at all the inflection points of their business to help them grow and scale. Um, so it's much more of a venture type program. We also have a venture fund. Um, we are an early stage technology investor and we're, we're technology agnostic. As long as you're working on tech and you are um, either located in Texas or there's something you can leverage using the Texas ecosystem, whether that's, you know, the defense partners that are here, whether that's, you know, the prime contractors or any of the investors or specialists in our ecosystem. It's it's my job to help make sure that those companies are finding and accessing those resources. Awesome. So that's what I do in a nutshell. Well, thank you, Elena. No, that that is super important. The reason we bring that up, folks, for everybody here, all our, our veteran entrepreneurs, is that you have to look at this non-dilutive that these teams are, are going to talk to you about today because that's a really important you know using america's seed fund or other programs you know through sba or the de defense partners to help bring a subtraction right and the capability for you to actually grow into the larger more complex federal uh, system but at the same time you also can't forget you do have venture capital which is also two sides of one coin you know you can't depend on one completely and be completely successful. So I think what this ecosystem and these guys are bringing to bear here uh, for our, you know, vendor community and, and, and just uh, um, and entrepreneurs writ large is the ability to kind of bring a marriage between non-dilutive capital and some of the venture capital together to help accelerate programs for national objectives and national interests. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over and introduce National Geospatial Agency and our team that we have here in Austin. Um, Lance Rogers and David Grover. So gentlemen, take it away. Give us a little bit inside of what you're doing and how uh, these great entrepreneurs might be able to connect or find some capital, non-dilutive capital with your agency. 
Great. Um, thank you, Jorge. Um, and thank you for having us today. We're, we really appreciate it. We're excited about the opportunity. Um, so David Grover, um, Lance Rogers with me here as well. Um, as Sori said, we represent the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, and, and we are really part of the research directorate. Um, so our, our mission is to deliver that future GeoInt capability and um, and bring operational impact into GeoInt and GeoInt intelligence. Um, we conduct research uh, across a broad spectrum of, of science, engineering, uh, and transform those into um, national security capabilities for our agency uh, and, and for our nation. Um, so, so we we do that through a variety of mechanisms, uh, both through through government partnerships, through industry, which is what we'll talk about today, and through academic relationships. And I'm going to I'll just briefly touch on those as well. Um, but primarily, um, we are a little bit more traditional in in how we do our our funding and our opportunities. The primary uh, avenue that we still use is the broad area announcement. Um, so on things like betasam.gov. Um, broad area announcements, we are changing that a little. Um, as uh, Casey mentioned, they can take nine months, a year plus to, to get on contract. Uh, some of the things that we're trying to do when, when you look today is, is we have what's called a big R BAA. Um, and what we're doing with that BAA is, is, is we are now opening that single BAA and adding uh, multiple topics underneath it. So instead of multiple announcements coming out that you have to keep looking back and, and going for and, and trying to pay attention to oh, what did NGA put out this time, um, you can actually just continue to look at a single announcement. They'll put multiple topics underneath. We have what's called a um, seedling open topic, which allows you to submit a white paper to us on any topic that and any solution that you feel is relevant to us. Um, so, so it really opens up the aperture to what you're able to, to bring to us. Um, we are also now able to do multiple contracting avenues through that single solicitation. So we are no longer limited to just some of the far base contracting. We can use um, OTAs, OTs, um, we can actually do grants and, and some of the academic proposals through that as well. And we can push you into things like our, our SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program. Um, so that BAA is, is how NGA is really pushing forward. Um, as I mentioned, we also have an SBIR program. Uh, very similar, we, we follow the DOD guidelines for the SBIR program. Um, and so we will follow the same guidelines that, that uh, both Army and Air Force will, will talk to you about as well. Um, I know Air Force is, uses their SBIR extremely uniquely, and we, we partner with them on that and, and have for the last year or so, which is great. Um, we also have things like prize competitions. Um, we have uh, CRADA opportunities, as well as um, some academic programs in, in the NURI realm that, that as you, and postdoc programs that, that if you're just leaving school and, and starting uh, as your postdoc, um, we have uh, programs that, that allow you to get funding through there as well. Awesome. You know, and, and David, that was super, super great what you did. I mean, just kind of explaining NGA and kind of the different mechanisms you use because it's kind of more on the traditional side, but you guys are also focusing on certain areas and you know a lot of people might not know what national geospatial agency does so when you're looking at kind of that big rbaa real quick can you tell the audience kind of what areas is nga somewhat interested in um just just for everybody they might not understand nga is actually another DOD agency in there uh give us a little bit of that yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we have an entire NGA strategy on technology and, and what we're doing doing and trying to go forward. Um, so in a synopsis, you can find that strategy on our website, nga.mil. Um, but really the, the three main focus areas that we have going forward are foundational geoint technology. Those are things like um, terrestrial and celestial reference frames, um, magnetics, um, feature extraction, attribution, um, bathymetric models, infrastructure, those kind of things. Um, we have advanced phenomenologies, uh, anything that has to do with uh, PNT, precision navigation and timing and, and the resilience there. Um, 
um, we have space situational awareness underneath, information assurance, so everything in the IT infrastructure type piece. And our third area that we're really focused on is analytic technologies. Um, so things like geospatial signatures, um, automated extraction, geopositioning, um, tracking, um, hypersonics, uh, Inf again, information assurance is big under that one. Um, image and video understanding. So uh, everything from assurance of that image and video uh, to, to uh, ensure that we are not receiving manipulated information um, to just quality new types of, of image and video and new spectral sensors and all that. Um, and, and, and a variety of things around that, that realm. So, so those are kind of our three main focuses. All right. Well, thank you. And we'll circle back with the others uh, like AL. I'd also like to, you know, once we're done with Rapid X, uh, go circle back to you and let's see what some of the focus areas you guys have in the near term. And Rapid X, obviously, as you guys introduce yourself, uh, let us know what Air Force is looking at here recently for focus areas. So without further ado, I want to introduce again. We've got Lieutenant Colonel Chase Eiserman. Uh, he works for SAP AQC, which is the contracting um, uh, for the Air Force. And we also have Michael Piller, who is our RapidX uh, liaison here in Austin, Texas, working with the rest of the Defense Innovation Network uh, that is here alive and well in Austin, Texas. So gentlemen, let us know a little bit about RapidX, how that kind of dovetails with AFWorks, kind of, you know, let, get us smart on it. Because I think RapidX, even though you guys have been around a little bit, you're kind of like a, a, a newish entrance into uh into defense innovation here from a contracting perspective. So over to you, gentlemen. Yeah, Jorge, I really appreciate you letting us go last because what was just referenced by the other two guests is exactly what we're trying to establish now through RapidX in the Air Force, right? As Michael has coined it, we, have a, we don't have an innovation uh, identification problem. We have an innovation transition problem. So everything after we've made that initial investment, like Dr. Purley mentioned, we're targeting that as our opportunity to help those small business and innovation units transition that to you know full funding programs of record, wherever the case may be. So I think everything beyond Cyber Phase Two, those small dollar initial investments, and then how do we grow that into a program of record or get it uh, operationalized now to the warfighter? But specific to this discussion, I'll turn it over to Michael to talk about uh, what we call StratFi and TACFi. Yeah, no, thanks, sir. And uh, once again, I appreciate being a part of the panel. But to take things a little bit differently, uh, Air Force has been looking at what we're calling big bets. So that's where um, we're taking, you know, the the Sibber Sitter program, which is those phase ones and phase twos, identifying strategic technologies that are able to be scaled uh, at a much larger rate because of the commercialization piece, their dual use, a higher TRL level. So these these big bets is what they're calling them. And I highly encourage everybody just to give AF Ventures 2020 uh, a Google, and you're going to be able to see the AF Ventures published report. And uh, in there, you're going to see some pretty staggering numbers when it comes to the Air Force's involvement in the SIBR. And that's really, uh, to Chase's point, you know, Air Force doesn't have have an, uh, an innovation problem, they have an innovation adoption problem. And this is sort of where the Stratify attack buys were able to see out of the initial tranche of, I mean, it's almost 3,000 individual awards since 2018. I mean, 100 and almost 1,500 companies. Like, that's a lot, right? So to sort through those to identify strategic tech, this is the second year that they've been doing it. And uh, what it is, is uh, we're, we work hand in hand with the Small Business Administration to understand, hey, we've identified this tech. Uh, can we have a waiver from the process, from the from the actual SIPR policy directive uh, to increase the funds so we can do that, that get everything ready for that scaling, that, that final piece, that Cibber phase three. But from a non-dilutive uh, finance standpoint, it really pumps it up. And then on top of that, we also, because it's a dual use possibly, right? Um, there's that private investment piece. So we're actually trying to bridge the two to incorporate them and say like, hey, we will match, you know, Air Force fundings, uh, AF, uh, Air Force Cyber funding, and that, that those two pieces, we want equal amounts of private investment too, and then put them together. So the possibilities are upwards to $60 million for, for a potential contract um, in certain technologies that will be game changing as, as uh, identified by other individuals like Dr. Roper, right? And uh, he's a big name. So uh, possibly a way more enthusiastic speaker than myself as well about this topic. 
But I'll be honest with you, we're really excited because uh, much like our, our co-panelists, the CSO has been a game changer, right? So those pilot programs on what we're really trying to do to uh, address some of the concerns Dr. Curley had actually about how do we make sure that small businesses know that we have equal skin in the game to grow that specific emergent technology base, right? Uh, because uh, I, you've said it before and I'm gonna, I'm gonna poach it from you. It's not a part of our doctrine, right? Like the emergent technology base. How do we go about purposefully developing some of these businesses to make them more robust. And uh, I always tell people, you know, we learned a lot about ourselves during this last disruptive year, right? Uh, what what are we remembering about this? You know, well, number one, we shouldn't rely on people that's outside of the states to, to provide us supplies, right? Like that that's just like a generalized thing. Well, how does that apply to the Air Force? Because we are a part of that environment, right? Like how do we develop a domestic capability for that, and then more importantly, uh, from a counter acquisition objective, that's something else that Chase and I are pursuing as well. So I'll get off my soapbox and uh, plenty more of where that came from if you want some more. Well, real quick, I mean, you, you mentioned one key word. Again, we're, we're used to in DOD, uh, our alphabet soup, and we use it without even thinking. And you mentioned CSO. What the heck is that, man? I mean, what is a CSO? Because I mean, everybody knows as small business innovation research, you know, uh, you know, small business technology transfer program, right? As SBR, SDDR, but in the alphabet soup, you just dropped out CSO. Explain that a little bit, and how yeah, is yeah. that how is that related to our fundraising? Absolutely. So um, what it is is actually uh, mm -hmm. it was initiated in a uh, the National Defense Appropriations Act of fiscal year nine or 17, 16, 16, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so President Obama said, hey, listen, we want to be able to, to reach out to our commercial sector, our non-traditional business space, and let's do a pilot program, essentially, which is we want to see if we are going and approaching things from a different solicitation method, which commercial solutions openings is a solicitation method. So just to make sure everybody's uh, speaking the same language here, um, but we go out and solicit to, to non-traditional business space, essentially the commercial space. Hey, private industry, what technologies do you have that would fit underneath these specific mission areas that we're really trying to get to? Hypersonics, uh, AI, you know, like there would be all of these things underneath that. And then from that moment on, um, you are now sort of operating in the commercial space because it's, it's a, for that specific authority, um, you're basically able to go ahead and start reaching out to those companies and see if we can streamline the acquisition process too. So the awarding time, and actually I have a stat for you. So um, on average, it takes about 72 days for, for the AFRL team to use a CSO uh, to award their contracts uh, as a result of, of that solicitation. So 72 days, it's not great in the private industry because they, you know, they, they see something, they go buy it just like you and I, right? Like, oh, I'm not going to wait 72 days to go buy myself a car uh, if I've already identified that that's the car I want and I have the money. Uh, you know, being the, the, the group that we are, we have rules and we have to make sure that we're, we're following them. But 72 days is, is not a bad gig um, when it comes down to it, especially because what we're trying to do is acculturate a, a new group of people that have never worked with the federal government ever before. And I think that that's like the main thing that I always want to foot stomp is that CSO authority is, is not meant to make things easier or, 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 or uh, less burdensome. What it is, is how can we, if we had an actual environment, an acquisition lab, if you will, and we were saying, hey, rule Outback Steakhouse style, as I say, no rules, just right kind of thing. Hey, go out, talk to people and make sure that you get it done as quickly as possible and come back and tell us, was this a success for us? Because ultimately this could allow us to have that authority pass the pilot program piece. Um, so I, I sort of deviated a little bit, but from the Air Force's point of view, and I would actually be interested to hear what NGA has to say about using CSOs. Um, but from, from where I'm sitting right now, uh, it's been, I would say successful is a good word. Um, I do think that we're sort of data mining all the information that we've gotten because they did use CSOs to try to bring in commercial non-traditional businesses during our COVID response for the Air Force led efforts, right? So we're still trying to data mine how many companies did we attract? How quickly were those wards done? Are there any issues with the process? And then capitalizing on it. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for that. Lance, did you have something? Seems yeah. like you're raising your hand. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in here representing NGA with, with David Grover here. So, yeah, a couple thoughts I wanted to add. I, I can't speak particularly to NGA's use of CSOs, but, I, but I, uh, another acquisition method that folks are hearing more and more about is the other transaction authorities. And in, in, in NGA, it has been 
you know, we're leaning forward. We're trying, we're just like the rest of the folks in this call. We're, we're DOD. We're part of the IC. There's, there's, there's rules and regulations, but we do have OT authority, other transaction authorities, otherwise known as OTs. But NGA has been using those now for several years. We're getting better and better at them. And in fact, in, in, in certain situations, traditionally, we, we've done all our OTs via consortiums. And we're still using consortiums for some of our OTs, but we're finding those right ones where we have the, the broader reached industry directly from NGA over the last few years of, of trying to energize their innovative innovation efforts. We're, we're starting to send some OTs straight to industry. And, and, that's, uh, and, and that's one way we're, we're trying to innovate and evolve our acquisition processes. The other, the other one I wanted to bring up when it comes to non-dilutive capital is NGA is actually currently running an accelerator out of the St. Louis area. So if mm -hmm. folks aren't aware, we have two major headquarters, one on the East Coast in Virginia area, D.C., and the other one's in St. Louis, Missouri area. And uh, in the, the first cohort of that accelerator, we have three planned, is ongoing now. You know, and, and, and part of that is the companies that made the final selection to that accelerator are getting cash awards just to, you know, for a congratulations for being accepted to the accelerator and then everything else that goes along with the accelerator, the access to the NGA mission owners, you know, program managers to help build their, their ideas that the NGA folks thought were good enough to, you know, we selected into the accelerator in the first place. So there's, I bring that up for those, anybody on the call and, and, and David, David did a great job, you know, of talking about our wide area of, of areas in science and engineering technology we're looking at. So be on the lookout because there's going to be a second cohort this fall and a third one planned for early 2022. So that's that's another opportunity that NGA is trying to lean forward to become more innovative as well. So well, let, let me let me pull on that a little bit, Lon. So you mentioned a cash opportunity so to get into the accelerator. So um, again, another another source of non dilutive capital that uh, allows our entrepreneurs here in the local area and across Texas really to to uh, really join in the fabric with NGA. So what, what does that look like when you mean uh, being part of that? Maybe what's the process and how much how much non-dilutive capital are you giving just to get in and then what potentially could be on the other side of that accelerator? Yeah, well, I, for I can talk about the first part, the first mm -hmm. part, each of those those companies, I think we had eight companies selected for the first for the first cohort and they each got 100K you know, straight out the door with potential for more dilutive, uh, non-dilutive capital from NGA as well. The second part of your question is, we're, is, is we don't know, we're trying to figure that out. I mean, that's the goal of this accelerator is, is we know now the next challenge as the other folks in the call have all, we've all talked about is how do we, how do we adopt those new technologies that we've identified with that see great potential? So, and that's, and, and, and you know, that's why we, we actually, knew this whole program from the start said we want to do the, the three iterations of this because we're going to learn each time we may not get it completely right on the first cohort but but that is that's what we're trying to, to lean forward and learn how how bringing we're hoping that bringing these companies working side by side and and and, and uh, going back and forth with the nj mission owners that own that particular mission set that 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 innovative company um is, is developing can can help help them gain traction within NGA. And, and, and also it, it's a two-way street. It's also help inform NGA of what's happening in industry to, to know what's possible because the other piece is that, that informs their future, their future acquisitions and, and RFIs that go out to industry. So I, I know I didn't answer your question that well, but we, there's, there's a lot of thoughts going through our minds on what happens after the accelerator. So. No, you're, you're doing great because what's what we want to make sure that the audience knows is that the federal government collectively. So here we kind of, you know, showing a joint force kind of thing. We're all working in different ways to kind of lower barriers to entry and really improve the success rate of our new emergent technologies coming from our entrepreneurs right into the fabric of what could become a program of record or at least if not a program of record, uh, part of the supply chain to really help out the, you know, the DOD on what they need for national security objectives. So no, very, very good answer. Um, and definitely what we'd love to do is um, if you guys, while we kind of go over to Dr. Casey Purley, if you guys can put a link or something where, where folks can learn a little bit more about that accelerator, I'm sure they'd uh, they'd be happy to look into that and maybe reach out to you later. But uh, to keep this move along, Dr. Casey Purley, back to the Army Applications Lab and the cool stuff you guys are doing. So we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of general in program. Can you help the team here understand 
you know, first of all, again, that non-dilutive capital, how does it look like at the beginning, kind of in the middle and towards the end? And what's the process that they would take? So if they wanted to reach out to you tomorrow and say, look, I think I have something that fits fits this and you guys already have your end to end kind of people that can help them. How does that process look like and how much money are we looking at for them to kind of get started with you? Absolutely. These are great questions. So the best thing to do is to go to our website, which is aal.army or follow us on LinkedIn at Army Applications Lab. Well, just like everybody here, we have to post all of our ongoing opportunities on the typical federal government website called Beta Sam, where that's where we all post our opportunities. Uh, we also use leverage social media and especially our website to tell people about what's going on. You should check our website frequently, maybe next week. I'd recommend checking our website next week uh, to yeah. learn about upcoming opportunities that we might be having. Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? So um, AAL typically brings companies in on one of two types of contracts. Uh, the first is what I like to call a proof of concept contract. It's about $200,000 or less, typically a three to four month period of work. In that time, we'll really introduce you to the problem we're trying to solve, the stakeholders, the soldiers or the end users. Um, and we'll ask at the end for you know, a small demonstration of, of the concept you're proposing to solve it. About 75% of companies come into AAL on those proof of concept contracts, and about a third of those companies have progressed to a second contract for prototyping efforts. The rest of our companies, like I said, about 25% come in on those prototyping contracts, um, about a million to a million and a half, maybe two million, depending on the project, uh, right? Those are typically longer, 18 to 24 months, um, and you build us the solution that you've come up with to solve our problems. Um, at the end of the day, we've given out about $40 million to uh, 65 companies in the two years that we've been around. Um, but what's exciting to me is that one of the companies we've worked with has actually been able to grow their workforce by a third uh, through their DOD work. Uh, and another company was able to accelerate a funding round and successfully closed it on the strength of the work that they've done for us proving that you know, not only are we getting value from working with these partners and bringing their ideas in, but these companies are also getting value for their for themselves for the work that they are doing with us. That's awesome. I mean, thank you for that, Casey. And, and you actually, you answered one of our, uh, our questions from the audience, which was kind of how much money has been committed from the non-traditional small businesses in one fiscal year. Now I can say that, you know, there's about maybe a year and a half worth of good data because you know DOD has been really working hard at how, how do they compress, accelerate, and repackage these programs. But you know, to to Casey's point, 65 million, um, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's really great traction, and hopefully more added to come as these programs mature. So I, I want to kind of pose that same question to the rest of the folks here. So um, and so with RapidX AppWorks, I know you put a link there. But kind of in general, what have you seen from the business end of, of work being done by Air Force and then NGA? Uh, you can follow through with, with, with something as well. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry about that. Uh, so um, some of the work that we have seen, I mean, so here's the honest goodness truth. Um, and I, I, I was born and raised in Northeast Ohio, so I always champion back to, uh, to, to my home, my home city and, and that's Cleveland, Ohio, but, um, the air force has had a disruptive, uh, mentality shift and we're no longer focused on, uh, being the best team in the NBA with the best record. So insert golden state warriors, 2016, uh, we care about winning the championship and that's LeBron James carrying the Cavaliers to the 2016 championship hoisting that, that that's what we care about. We want to be those LeBron Jameses, right? So what does that look like really in this analogy? Well, that's transitioning tech to a program of record because uh, if um, anybody wants a good read, our new chief of staff of the Air Force, his name is General Brown, four most important words in the Air Force, accelerate, change or lose. Like that's it. How do we get that disruptive technology fielded quicker? How do we get that ex accelerated or agile ability to to put something on contract get it into a program program of record and get it fielded out to the to the airmen and guardians of the world right that's what we're trying to get to but most importantly understanding what what realm what what how do we go about looking at our investment portfolio right to understand really where where those areas are that we're investing the most into and then more importantly how do we pick out the winners just like anybody else we have to have that return on investment 
And that's that next gen metrics is what I'm calling um, out, uh, outcome based um, metrics. So really, what is what is the disruptive force or the actual increased capability? Is it speed? Is it ability? Uh, I, I don't know if anybody else is tracking this, but the, the United States government admitted that we have UFOs. Like, is, are we going to be able to, to match UFO engines? You know, that sonic no boom, it doesn't sound like, are we going to be able to match UFOs? Is that the technology that we're tracing? You know, like those kinds of things that we're trying to redirect everybody's energies on. And that's why um, uh, we put a we put a link in uh, one of our private chats. But uh, I, I highly recommend um, taking a look at the AF Ventures year end report um, to talk about dollars specifically. Mm -hmm. It's a $710 million have been awarded to phase one and phase two. So much like uh, AAL and mm -hmm. NGA, we have like those different phases. So proof of concept, mm -hmm. prototyping, white yeah. papers, those, those things. Um, but uh, as far as like those specific examples, there are a few that are listed in that uh, AF Ventures year end report, but specifically it's pretty wide um, as far as like our, our net. Okay, awesome. So we'll take a look at that report, but man, $710 million, man, that that's a lot. Um, but but then again, you also mentioned transition. So there's probably a little more questions there in just a second. But how about Team NGA? Um, what do you guys have as far as some metrics to to answer uh, Paul N's question here in the chat? Um, so honestly, I'm going to plead the fifth on our, our metrics a little bit. Um, so understand NGA is a much, much smaller organization than um, our, our military and DOD partners. So our overall budget is um, fractions of, of what they are uh, in that realm. Um, you know, so we are doing our best to 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 modernize our biggest challenges, as he put, and we heard others, is, is that transition. Um, so so we're able to bring in a, a variety of companies, as as Lon said, our accelerator, we have eight companies going through our accelerator. Um, so, so again, contrast our size compared to the, you know, 300 plus that, that um, you know, the Air Force is able to do and all that. We're on the factor of eight um, to 10 per cohort. We're trying to do that two to three times a, a year. So, um, so understand we are a smaller agency. Um, and, and with that, we have smaller budgets, we have smaller capabilities. Um, but but we're really also trying to focus on how do we take those those solutions that we have, how then do we transition them into programs of record? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the challenge you're hearing from all of us on the panel is is we as the DoD really haven't figured that out yet in a lot of cases. Um, so we're all trying different things. We have set up a, a specific group in in our research area that is dedicated to transition. Um, and, and that just started this last fall. So, so we're um, looking at um, hopefully this next year having some metrics coming out of that. They're a fairly new organization. Um, we also started an industry engagement process. Uh, so, so whether we give you capital or funding or not, um, we actually now have a, a formal process that if you come to our front door and um, on the contact button, there's industry engagement at NGA.mil. Um, we now can put you through a process to get you in front of those program managers and, and, and help identify those so that we can start transitioning that technology. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a lot of metrics. Um, we are at early stages of a lot of those things. Um, but but again, we're we're trying to, as as the rest of the panel is, uh, you know, we're trying to look at things a little differently. We're trying to change our mantra a little bit. Uh, one of the other things that we recently did is put out what we call a moonshot. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're trying to change our vision. Um, so, so again, very similar to what Michael just mentioned uh, that the Air Force is doing. We're we're changing what our end goal is, um, and and we call it our moonshot. Uh, reference back to the you know 1960s but uh, but again we're, we're really trying to push out there that's awesome and you know what no excuse because that's what we're all doing we're doing transition um and, and you know what i'm hearing here is you know army you've got a really great prescriptive way you've thought about the transition and you almost have that kind of pre-packaged in yours uh still i think 65 75 million just great amount and you're just getting started so i'm really super excited to see where where you're going to go there casey um, going along. Um, and then, you know, obviously Air Force, Team Air Force, you guys did great. You seeded the ground, you got a lot, but now it seems like we've got to concentrate on transition, right? How do we get that better? You've got TACFI and Stratfi programs, which help some of those companies. But this is really important just to let this ecosystem know that uh, like NGA, 
you know, even though they're smaller, they're still having, you know, go into their programs because they all have kind of curated ways to help you succeed with that non-dilutive capital, right? So there is non-dilutive capital right now that is alive and well across several of the agencies, if not most of the agencies in SBIR. They're all working hard and they all have different nuances on how to do it, but they're all going to the same end, which is how do we equip the warfighter and give you the entrepreneur that opp opportunity, right? To, to be part of America's fabric and expanding the industrial base. So I, I have one more question I'm gonna ask, but before I go to the question from James W, um, I, haven't, I haven't forgotten, we've got a few minutes left. Helena, I wanted to bring you up real quick because you bring a really unique perspective. You're seeing from the, the venture side, what all this non-dilutive capital be from the army, uh, entrepreneurs that are you know, in your portfolio, to the Air Force uh, portfolio, down to the NGA portfolio, you've seen kind of a cross section of all this. Um, how how is this non-dilutive capital important and and um, the private investment side is it gaining attention and are people more um, more apt to invest in these startups knowing that they are part of these awesome uh, DoD programs that are being described today that's a really good question so I, I'd say that the answer is yes and there's there's definitely caveats there so in, in my experience at capital factory one of the things that we're seeing um, and this you know, this could by nature be a, a direct result of COVID, right? And the, the requirement that everyone has to go be indoors for a year, right? You know, the way that a lot of venture capitalists work for a long time is that you would go and meet people for coffee constantly back to back with meetings. And one of the things that we saw is that entrepreneurs and investors were forced to move virtually. So we were able to um, you know, look at things that we might not have invested in previously, um, whether that's geographically or because of specific technology areas. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, one of the things that we saw was that that area opened up to us exponentially. Um, and here at Capital Factory, you know, there's there's always sort of been a, a, a strong presence of dual use focused companies. But one of the things that we saw, you know, during this during this COVID period was that number sort of uh, rapidly increase, partially due to the fact that, you know, private capital might have been harder to come across, right? Um, so, you know, personally, I have a lot of experience working in the government space. So one of the things that I recommended to some of the capital factory portfolio companies was to go look into non-dilutive capital options. You know, the government is, you know, one of the biggest customers on earth, right? Doesn't matter what you're selling. There's probably a market for it somewhere with a government customer. So um, pointing those entrepreneurs in our ecosystem to the government as a customer was really useful in helping those companies to get by, you know, in the year where private capital might be in as, as um, accessible. So um, the answer is yes, we, we've seen a lot of companies um, have this shift, you know, previously where they might not have thought that they qualified as a dual use company. They found that, you know, what they were working on, even though it's not an explicit defense application, was a strong dual use category. And they were able to go find a customer and able to go out and, um, you know, contribute to that new base influx of companies that, you know, AFWorks and AAL and all these organizations are investing in. So short answer is yes, we're seeing a lot of it. Um, in terms of what we see is, you know, favorable, I absolutely see that as a strong, uh, strong case study that there is dual use applicability here, right? If you're coming in and you have uh, you have substantial SIBR and SIDR awards underneath your belt, if you're making progress towards program of record and you have a customer in the government that is continuously wanting to iterate and work with you, that's a really strong proof point that you're probably uh, you know, a good candidate for some kind of dilutive capital. Um, but that's, you know, that's definitely a separate conversation. And, um, you know, one thing I always like to tell people is that uh, private capital investment is not for everyone. And um, you want to make sure to use it strategically and with the right intention and from the right people at all times. So um, absolutely, definitely encourage anyone who's interested, who has dual use technology, go after non-dilutive capital first. Um, and then let's think about what's the right type of, uh, you know, diluted capital for you to go after, whether that's, you know, angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a right time and place to use that. And I think that they work really well uh, in, in orchestra together to form really compelling dual use companies. Awesome. Well, we're running a little bit uh, yeah, out of time just in a second, but there's one question. James W. has a great question that us in the defense uh, innovation community get all the time here at Capital Factory, which is, 
Uh, I'm going to read it. We have an innovative technology and wireless transmission of electricity at the industrial level, but needs a global demonstration project. Would any of you be interested to assist in funding the development of this disruptive type of technology? So when we get these types of uh, you know entrants, people coming in the door, and this is a great question, James. Um, I'm going to pose it to the team here. Who wants to raise their hand and say, I think we might be able to connect you somehow? <laughs> Anyone? I think the short answer is we want to know more, right? You yeah. know, from a, from a dilutive or non-dilutive standpoint, we definitely want to learn more. And um, I can definitely say from the Capital Factory perspective, shoot me a deck. I'm always looking for these kinds of technologies and, um, you know, whether or not the folks in this room are capable and ready to find a customer for you, there's there's definitely a space that, um, you know, a group like Capital Factory can help. So always open to get this uh, pitch deck. Awesome. Yeah, similarly from the Air Force, we've got uh, open challenge for uh, new energy sources and types. Uh, so that's out there uh, for someone to submit against. But same thing, we need to see the deck and see more information and, and see who we could hand that off to that, that's in the energy sector on the Air Force. Side. Over. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, I'm just going to echo what everybody has always said, like more information is key. Um, but for us, it's always keep an eye on our LinkedIn, keep an eye on our website. And if you think that is the solution to a problem we have, definitely want to hear more about it. Um, and we match the amount of funding required to the problem we're trying to solve. Um, so. All right. We would echo the same thing. Awesome. Well, hey, we had a great discussion. I want to thank all the panelists here, uh, Army Applications Lab, Casey, Thanks for representing. You always do an outstanding job. Uh, Chase, Michael, always an honor to have you guys online, my old colleagues. Uh, Lance, David, uh, always a pleasure to see your smiles and seeing you around Capital Factory. Hopefully we see more of you uh, as COVID lifts. And Helena, absolutely super uh, honored to always work with you and uh, and learn from just the, the dilutive side of the house because that's kind of new to me. But uh, I want to thank you guys all and just kind of in closing remarks to everybody here that's watching. Um, here you heard it from really the, the source of information that you want to be reaching out to. You know, Army, Air Force, NGA. I also know that Naval X, they weren't able to be on this call today, but you've got DIU as well. Um, we've got a lot of DOD uh, um, capabilities that are coming together to really help the American entrepreneur. And you as veteran entrepreneurs on this call, you just need to know and be aware that there's a lot of not only people uh, making themselves available uh, here in Austin, but across Texas, right, to to help you to help prop you up in your innovation. But to their point, uh, it's really hard to just come in and says, I've got a great idea that can change the world. Um, it's up to you to really bring that deck and really put uh, really align yourselves with what they're putting on their websites and their documentation say, this is what we're looking for for national security objectives. Not everything will make it, but there's a lot of con congruity that you can find with, or congruence that you can find with some of the things that they put up there and the things that you're working on. And a lot of times what I could just say, just from experience, it might just mean that you need to tweak your solution, your idea, or your problem set a little bit differently in order to meet the requirements that the government is really looking for. So if you do that, you do that, I, I am 100% positive that the wonderful people that are on this call and a lot of their colleagues uh, will be there to assist you, guide you, maybe even mentor you a little bit before you can reach that level of success. But do not be dismayed. There is capital, there is a lot of non-dilutive capital. It just takes a little bit of homework. But if you do that, having the grit that every entrepreneur has, you can be as successful as a SpaceX maybe one day. So. Uh, thank you all for being on this call. Thank you uh, to the audience for chiming in. Hopefully this was of value and uh, looking forward to doing more of these. So um, without further ado, um, signing off. Thank you very much, team. Thanks, everyone.